Episode 12, Dimwood, Ruins of Talandathar. Dax leapt over a deep crevice. Straightening his heavy pack, he righted himself as he took time to survey his surroundings. Most of the archaic city ruins jutted only three to six feet above the dirt. In some places, the depth of the surface was greater and the buildings appeared much taller, but the Rhinotaur Ranger knew that they were not. He guessed that the original foundation of this late level of the city was three or four stories underground. About a mile away, an entire block was raised and set at an angle, no doubt upended in some ancient upheaval. Through spidery roots and dirt, several layers of architecture could be seen in the broken city cliff. He began moving toward the center of the ruins, leaping from roof to roof. Some of the corners and outcrops he jumped to, to and from, only a few feet above the ground. As he traversed the empty and dead structures, he wondered how deep the ruins really went down. The surface structures were not the original Talandathar, nor were the two levels below what he was moving through right now. The oldest level of Talandathar was pre-cataclysm, buried in distant antiquity. Dax passed through what seemed like an open-air court now filled with rubble and dirt. Once he had covered about 2,000 feet from the tree line, the ranger turned around abruptly to scan the edge of the ruins for any movement or non-movement. The sensation of being watched or followed had been with him for hours. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, he was satisfied that his pursuer was well hidden. Long experience and training prevented him from assuming that there was no one there. He turned and leapt to the next rooftop and glanced ahead at the distant Acropolis. The seven-sided architecture bothered him, out of place in these dateless ruins. Between he and the Acropolis were massive earthquake fractures, broken buildings, mounds of rubble with shrubs and thickets that provided good concealment to anyone or anything waiting in ambush. Dax moved forward at a good pace, never conforming to any predictable pattern, changing directions multiple times. The ranger carefully walked a high roof wall and found himself looking six stories down into a gulf of shadow with dirt and shattered stonework. Levels of more ancient Talandathars could be seen clearly, and he noticed several apertures and even corridors exposed that would serve as possible entrances if the one on his map could not be found. He surveyed, he surveyed the environment warily. He was heavy, especially with his pack and gear, and there was no help to be had, to be had way out here. From time to time, he spied peculiar piles of sun-bleached dung, only noticing them because other piles of feces he'd seen were not sun-whitened. Dropping from a relatively flat surface that might have once been a roof, the rhinotaur again looked behind him. Instead of the tree line, his eyes fell upon a mishappened hulk lumbering between buildings. The figure was stooped, riddled with old muscle and covered in boils, some that leaked. It shuffled forward, keeping its face away from the sun. This was a cinder troll, but one obviously diseased. He had not been told to expect this, though he had been warned the cinder trolls might be in the area. The ranger quietly continued the sun in his face. He now entered the shadow shadow cast by the great Acropolis in the center of the ruins, and he instinctively knew he was very close to the cave entrance he was to find that would take him beneath the ruins. A rock tumbled behind him, and the cinder troll groaned. When Dax glanced back, he came face to face with a seven-foot-wide reptilian jaw filled with saber-like teeth. The troll was gone, and in its place stood a gigantic winged lizard with an odd reddish-scaled body and slit pupils regarding him. Huge nostrils flared. What are you? 
Dax understood the words perfectly, raised his arms free of weapons. His heel scraped the head of a buried statue, and he leaned backwards to catch a glimpse of a shaft or corridor that seemed to penetrate about 45 feet below the ground. Dax saw movement in his peripheral to the left of the creature. A body fell. The tree line. It fell out of sight slowly, almost far away. The enormous reptile whipped its head around to study the forest edge, hearing something beyond Dax's own ability. In the instant the Colossus was distracted, the Rhinotar fell backward and tucked into his drop. When he hit the rock-strewn slope, he pitched backward as a dark silhouette of the monster reptile filled the sky above him. Like a whip, its thick neck stretched and suddenly the razor jaws snapped only inches away from Dax as he tumbled backward into the depth of the shaft beneath the surface. On instinct, the rhinotar plunged into the blackness, head scraping across rock as his nose horn snagged, twisting his head. His right foot denied purchase in the dark. He sank inches and then found himself moving downward in a rock slide, just as a rushing wind of acrid heat blew past him. The entire alcove he had landed in only a second before was drenched in smoking. Acid. He then realized that the thing that tried to kill him in the forest near the lake was the same monster that had just tried to bite him in half and melt him. Dax stopped and caught his breath. Things rattled in his pack, broken objects from the fall. He kicked stones aside, finding a dirt-covered floor, walls of brick and mortar, a corridor, Litching along the ceiling and upper walls gave off a faint greenish glow. His sweat smearing the filth all over his body, Dax chose his direction wisely toward the Acropolis. Having traversed two halls, an underground courtyard with an expansive, muck filled pool with a dried fountain of carved boulders. Dax carefully moved forward along the rubble strewn hallway about fifty feet below the surface of the ruins above. Doorways and halls opened on either side of him, some half-filled with debris. He knew that some led to structures two and three stories high, their roofs visible from the ground. The Rhinotar Ranger also knew that there were older levels below his position, older cities. It was into those depths that he would soon descend. It had taken him about two hours to reach the area beneath the Acropolis at the center of the ruins, leaving the winged lizard far behind. That artificial hill with the seven-sided temple was now above him. He now stood in a rectang rectangular galley, gallery full of petrified tree roots, black dirt, foul-smelling moss, and weird thin lizards the size, size of toads that stood on their back legs and ran about. Flittingly. They blinked in the soft light of the incandescent glowing rod in his grasp. He ascended the stairway and walked straight into the Axis Templum. Once inside, he glanced about the interior. From the distance of the tree, tree line, this seven-sided building did not appear so large. He tried to make sense of what he was seeing, for this structure had no business amidst the ruins that were thousands of years old. Yet here it was. The tower temple was shaped like a heptagon, and it was remarkably intact, save for a cave-in at the juncture between two of its walls. On a platform of seven distinct steps like a pyramid stood a highly polished, dust-covered marble statue, a specimen of micro-fractures, but otherwise intact. A navigator, and a very ancient one. The robed form of one of the holy gods who ruled the multiverse. Dax stared up at the godlike statue. This he had not been prepared to find. The walls and parts of the floor not buried in filth were adorned with reliefs and dots, spheres, concave and con convex surfaces with lines, joints, solid three-dimensional edges and reliefs protruding from the walls. Perforated lines, bifurcated figures, bisected lines, rectilinear forms of all angles, triangular motifs, squares, and even cubes formed of the walls themselves. Hexagramic symbols were patterned throughout the geometrical artwork and even a framed dodecahedron of pentagons. But the most sacred symbol of the navigators was right below his feet. 
Dax saw the grand design of the floor and the walls, the alternating colors of marble, white with red veins and gray with black veins, that formed a perfect seven-pointed star from the center of the chamber extending to the seven corners of the walls and up to the ceiling, the heptagram, mark of the navigators. Dax wasted no time trying to decipher the geometrical messages on the walls. He knew he was not qualified. The ranger had seen this language displayed before at a place very far away, but he, was not, he had not anticipated seeing it here. He pulled out a folded piece of paper from a hidden pocket under his armor. It was a map, poorly made and with scribbles providing points of reference. Seeing the moist and blurred condition of the paper, he cursed. His words seared through the silence in a series of echoes as reminders that he profaned a sacred area. I'm a lost soul, he muttered, feeling a little irritated. He studied the wet paper. Of all the mediums available, they gave me paper. With the Axis Templum identified on the primitive map, he now knew how to get to where he was going. There were several more levels underground, each deeper than the other, each accessible by a stair. He saw the location of the staircase on this level, and then the locale of the next one on the level below. But the map was blurred so badly in some parts that the location of the other staircases to deeper levels would be guesswork. The bastards over a millennia designed the newer levels to be accessed from stairways that were widely separated. A defense against intruders finding their way into the interior back when people still lived in the city. Dax knew he was going to have to hunt for a couple, a couple of the staircases. Knife in hand and light in, in the other, the ranger set off in the direction of the first stairwell. As he moved, his mind played back the encounter with the talking giant winged lizard. Who are you? The creature had spoken to him. Before he could dwell upon this further, he saw the edge of the first stairwell in the light. And Dax began his descent. Haraginous Hellborn looked down dispassionately. The hyperventilating body of Hack, the assassin, trembled in the soft grass. His face was gone, pink and bloody bones showing. Already flies were appearing. The dark silk nymph had moments earlier departed following the mark down into the ruins after the departure of the Scarlet Dragon. The tortured expulterian bounty hunter who had demanded immunity be invoked had been killed himself. Well, he was almost dead. Naya Luna had chewed his face off, cheeks, chin, nose, ears, and sucked out his eyeballs. Still paralyzed from the Black Fairy's sorcery, he remained in agony, slowly fading, choking on the blood filling his throat. She had chewed most of his tongue. In the grasp of the misfortunate human's hand was Kin Flare, his sword useless. The Athrodoc nymph's ability to paralyze impressed the demon. Horaginus knew she had reached into Hack's brain with shadowy fingers and cast a second spell inside his head that rendered him unable to move. Fingers of shadow delivering an excruciating cold into his mind. Hack barely felt his face being eaten. The Free Walker was not really bothered by the fairy's cruelty. She was, after all, nearly soulless, a sentient animal. In the past hour, a third assassin had arrived on the scene, the draconian bloodmancer from the underworld named Genge. He had slipped into the ruins quietly, and Horaginus was amused that the bloodmancer arrived without his knowing, escaping his otherwise perceptive awareness. Something to look into at another time. He did enjoy his mysteries. The draconian dipped into the underworld complex right behind Nyaluna. Not a moment later, the Hellborn continued studying the scene, watching on with interest as a, gr as a great winged beast with short reddish hair looking like a large infernal flat-faced bat with leathery wings and short tail landed where the ranger and the two assassins had disappeared into the ruins. A wing moored. An armored four-armed dark elf dismounted and peered down the shaft. 
He stood there as two hundred hornback orcs hustled from the tree line further away to join him after, after ten minutes negotiating through the toppled and buried structures and mounds. They brought six umber slogs. Haraginus grinned as they went down into the ruins. Forty orcs remained on the surface, forming a perimeter around the wing moored. What interesting times, he mused. Ever the curious demon, the free walker stood still, closed his eyes, and concentrated. His consciousness extended outward, and the edge of the wood seemed to embrace his mind. His awareness was amplified as the material world dissipated. The demon relaxed as the world of the spirit took on substance in his mind's eye. He waited a moment, freeing himself of the threads that tried to keep him from disengaging with the physical. The eyes of his inner demon saw the souls of animals in the rocks and trees surrounding him. He noticed instantly that within the metal of the long sword kin flare was a confined, trapped essence of a human soul who had died in prolonged agony. Hack's own spirit was now fading, about to cross over to the other side. Haraginus read the infernal script across his spirit and knew that Hack was destined for Acheron in the hills. Trolls hiding from sunlight were spread throughout the ruins, resting in many structures. A few of them were diseased, and the sun no longer bothered them. An undead thing, formerly a woman long ago, stared directly at him from her haunt in a dungeon where she had perished for a crime that her son had committed. Her bones were still chained to the stone floor. Underneath him, and hundreds of feet down, were whale-sized worms that melted through the earth and stone, burrowing under and around the ancient ruins. Nearby was a colony of semi-sentient insectoid people in the woods. Another colony existed deep below Talandathar, a fairy gathering, very numerous, and among them was the spirit of a very powerful witch of the Shadow Fae. She was much older than Nyaluna. The essence of monsters and organic things he saw in his mind were as clear as if he was standing before them. The free walker was able to travel simply by the power of thought. The Mark, a ranger of extraordinary skill, training, and experience from a very distant place, was making good time. The demon knew he was following instructions or a map, for his movements were precise with few turns away from those places he ended up moving through. The mark had descended to level three and was just walking over the collapsed corridor ruins to a stairwell leading down to level four. Haraginus grinned. The ranger had a surprise waiting for him at the base of those stairs. Behind the mark, the shadowy form of the dark silk nymph followed. She was very clever and had already taken care of the problem of Genge. The too confident Bloodmancer was about to find out. Concentrating at a greater range in all directions, the Hellborn perceived a colossal, multi legged plant creature of limited intelligence moving slowly over the treetops. It was hunting, looking down at Hack's body from a distant angle, but waiting for him to leave the area. It wasn't a stupid plant. Haraginus had almost missed it, for the creature was more foliage than feral. Concentrating downward, he could not help but wonder how the ranger came across so detailed specific information to move through the subterranean complex with such apparent ease. From his vantage point, each level was an immense labyrinth packed with obstacles. Pondering the ranger below, Haraginous mind collided with the mind of another. An ancient mind. The Hellborn almost reeled, for in that flash of awareness he realized he was confronted with an intelligence far beyond his own, and his eyes popped open in alarm. In that precise instant, his thoughts were read and understood and stolen by the powerful being far underneath Talandathar. It now knew that the ranger was descending toward it. Haraginus refocused, images flash burned within the recesses of his mind, memories many tens of thousands of years old. He was now convinced that he had stumbled upon the most unusual developments. 
He stood still, and his eyes fell upon the architecture of the Navigator Temple. Like the ranger, he knew that it was not supposed to be here. A merle deep in the underworld wanted this ranger dead. A divinity cell far below an ancient human ruin called Del- Talandathar contained an imprisoned and enraged immortal directly under but at great depth below the Axis Templum. The ranger foolishly made his way straight for this most unholy deity. As a free walker among the ranks of devils, demons, undead, and fiends, Horaginus had traveled abundantly over the eons learning about the mechanics of the multiverse, the ebb and flow of beginnings and endings, the celestial dynamics influencing mundane events, learning who was what and how they got there. He had discovered that angels, solars, planetars, decans, centenars, and even the time-bending chronicons can be defeated but never killed, that the navigators were immortal but far more powerful than the echelons of angelic beings, that even the navigators were in service to some unknown they feared and venerated, a creator that remained an enigma in the hells. Though immortals were undying, they yielded to defeat and confinement. In his diverse travels, the Hellborn had discovered long ago that there were two kinds of beings a demon best not meddle with without extreme caution and a bit of luck. One of those beings was under Talandathar, a remnant of the old gods throughout the realm simply known as the Banished dark immortals who had lost out in some primordial war. The others were Rhinotars on a mission. Dax spat a steady stream of curses as he slid smoothly along the slimy stone floor. The oily sheen prevented him from slowing down and he hit the wall hard. Indignant, the ranger stood and brushed off off the dust and rubble that fell from him as he turned to look back down the corridor at the thing that attacked him at the base of the stairs. He was studying the wet map under the light when a pile of bones and rock decided to stand up and knock the crap out of him. The powerful blow sent him a ways down the hall to collide into a broken wall that then itself decided to fall on him. And now he saw it. A glowing-eyed fossil golem constructed of stone, some crystalline coral, seashells, and petrified starfish with the impressions of prehistoric marine animals. It was a good two heads taller and about eight times heavier than he was. The golem made no sound as it charged him, plowing over a broken pillar as it trudged through the debris. The rhinotaur moved quickly out of the way at the last second and the heavy golem passed right through the wall. Old bricks fell and dust billowed up. Through the haze, he watched the large form get back up. Dax was about to reach into his pack when he heard something. Voices? A crowd? The communication sounded primitive, monosyllabic. He moved around the hole in the wall, leaping over a rock the map tucked back into its pocket. He put some distance between he and the violent golem. Behind him, four cinder trolls holding clubs followed his scent. Two trolls swiftly shambled down the hall and leapt over the boulder after passing the large statue that stood blocking the opening in the wall. The other two trolls saw the statue blink. Both trolls whimpered as crushing fingers clutched them, lifted them in the air, and collided their bodies together three times. Their broken bodies were discarded by the fossil golem. The other two cinder trolls pursued Dax until the piercing howling echoed through the corridor. A haunting echo lingered and the trolls forgot their quarry. They slinked off into the blackness in another direction, not at all liking such an unfamiliar howling. But the ranger knew that sound, the howl of the strange, shaggy, six-legged beast he had fought when he had first arrived in Dimwood. In moments, Dax located the fifth stairwell and began his descent. He did not hear anything trying to follow him. This concludes episode 12.